to call to order this uh, meeting of the first five Sacramento Commission for Monday, March 6, 2017. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and establish a quorum. Dave Gordon. Here. Beth Hassett. Terrence Jones. Here. Olivia Kassiri. Here. Paul Lake. Here. Scott Moe. Here. Phil Cerna. Here. Donna Snaringer. Here. Steve Wirtz. Here. Lee Turner Johnson. Here. Kathy Kosick. Here. Terry Porter. Here. Christina Elliott. Sick Lester. Patrick Kennedy. Here. We have a quorum. And with uh, Beth Hassett being out today, alternate Steve Wirtz will be voting in her place. Very good. Thank you. This meeting of the first five Sacramento Commission is Cablecast Live on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel, on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse Cable Systems. This meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Wednesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the board may sign a speaker request form at the kiosk located in the back of the room. Please bring, bring the form to the staff member seated behind me. When, and when you're speaking to the board, um, speak into the microphone and state your name for the record. If you have any electronic devices, please put them on silent or turn off now. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kosick, will you do us the honor of leading us in touch, please? Thank you. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's commission meeting. Uh, again, friendly reminder, if you choose to address the commission on any item that is on the agenda, you're welcome to do so. We ask that you leave a speaker slip and give it to our clerk. Uh, you're also welcome to address this commission on any item that's not on our printed agenda. Uh, we do ask that you keep your comments to three minutes so that everyone has a chance to address this commission if they so choose. So with that, our first item, please. Consent. Actually, before you do that, sorry. <clears throat> uh, I believe this is Commissioner uh, Kennedy's uh, first uh, uh, commission meeting. Oh, so I nice. want to welcome my colleague from the Board of Supervisors, Supervisor uh, Patrick Kennedy, uh, who is, um, uh, has a long reputation, a good one of uh, representing the best interests of children here and his past capacity as a school board member and certainly I've come to know him as one on the Board of Supervisors. So welcome, Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, sir. Yes. Now, we go on to our first item. <laughs> Consent item one, approve February 6, 2017, draft action summary. Okay, any commissioner wish to uh, change? Commissioner Kosick. I just wanted the record to reflect I was not present at that meeting. Okay. Can we make sure that that is uh, recorded? Yes. Appropriately. Okay. Any other comments or questions or suggestions, changes? If not, entertain a motion. So moved to approve. Been moved by Commissioner Jones. The chair will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. <coughs> motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next item, please. Item two public comment on non agenda items. Okay, again, this is the public's opportunity to address this commission on any item not on the agenda. I don't have any speaker slips and I don't see anyone approaching the podium, so we will assume that uh, that has been exhausted. Next item, please. <laughs> item three, executive director's report. Julie. Good afternoon, commissioners. The brief uh, director's report and then I have a small addendum because so many things happened last <laughs> week that I came out after the packet was completed. So um, it looks brief, it's a little bit longer. Uh, I'll start with good news. We uh, found, we got word that uh, Sacramento County in partnership with Amador County received a dental transformation initiative grant. Uh, we had requested $11.5 million and we will find out on March 15th uh, how much of that funding will be awarded to our county. Uh, the funding um, will come through Department of Health and Human Services, but First Five is collaborating on the grant and will actually house three or four of the staff uh, who will be working on the on DTI. And our local project will be uh, to, uh, we have three strategies. We're gonna do virtual dental home, which takes dental treatment and services out into the community at school districts to serve children. And we'll be doing a medical dental collaboration, which works uh, through our uh, 
federally qualified health centers and community clinics and connects them with dental services, sometimes even in a van parked in the parking lot if they don't have their own dental services, but a warm handoff from the medical side to the dental side. And then we will also uh, train and educate our, our service providers, not medical or dental, but just uh, family Resource Center staff and many First Five partners will be trained and they will then begin to incorporate a dental education message into all the other services and messages that they provide to our uh, children and fam families. So very exciting and we'll keep you posted. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Jones. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kasiri, um, Julie, as well as Deborah Prane, who's not in the audience here, but for the tremendous amount of work they put in to secure this uh, grant. I think it was an excellent job. I think it has those three strategies, I think, are unified as well by a care coordination package that I think um, ties all those strategies together and, you know, is a very sustainable package. I think in addition to the fact that we have maybe $11 million that is going to be distributed Distributed to children and families within the community. That money is tied to many of our current funders uh, that we support here and support us here in uh, First Five. So that money is distributed and I think impacts a lot of beneficiaries and but also our <coughs> provider base and has a great deal to uh, sustain oral health and many of the programs that we support. So I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, opportunity here and again thank you Dr. Kasiri, Julie and Deborah. Well said and certainly have the chair's um, support and uh, <coughs> sincere gratitude for all the work that went into it. Thanks. And um, we uh, had a few things to add on to our uh, continuing steps, putting kids first. This is the follow-up of our convening, um, our town hall, as we were calling it. Uh, we did get a photo in N Magazine, the Thomas Magazine, uh, with Chair Serna, Carrie Aiello, and Aaron Mori, and that went out to thousands of families in the Natomas area to really promote the, the event. Um, we've blasted out our video, uh, The Future of First Five Sacramento. Uh, it's on websites, it's on the in in association's internet, and it got sent to thousands, <laughs> I think, of people. So we're getting that word out with that. And um, to follow up with our school districts, we're working with children now, uh, developing a strategy plan in order to talk to school districts more about incorporating early learning into their uh, LCAPS, remember Local Control Accountability Plan, and then to try to get funding through the Local Control Funding Formula to really focus on early learning as part of that. So we uh, will continue to do that. We also had um, Senator Pan hosted a town hall of his own on his Children's Bill of Rights, um, and uh, that was on the 28th of February. Chair Serna was on the panel, as well as two speakers from our convening, uh, Assemblymember McCarty and Craig Cheslog from Common Sense Kids Action. Um, and the event had a lot of parent advocates there. It was another opportunity for First Five to build upon the momentum from our convening and to highlight our key points about declining revenue and uh, the need for policy change. And, and I will say, just as a panelist, uh, I did everything I possibly could to interject at the appropriate time on this panel uh, the connection between uh, county governance and working with our and through our First Five uh, commission to make sure that we're maximizing the uh, availability of resources for early learning and and health for kids zero to five. I will tell you it was one of the more um, trying um, panel discussions uh, uh, in a town hall setting that I was part of for a variety of reasons I won't go into. I'll just let it be known the bruises are slowly healing. Um, but I thought it was a, a good opportunity to um, actually do some pretty general education for those that uh, some that didn't even understand that we have uh, a first five in each of our 58 counties so um, I believe it or not Aaron I, I actually look forward to uh, future opportunities to do more of that so it was great to have you up there thanks um, I wanted to touch on the pride and joy uh, baby shower I do have a video to show you which will cue in just a minute um, but 
I've been sending you things all week as we've been getting them um, back from our contractors and from uh, the media, so you, you know the success of this uh, story. But we had an estimated 232 participants, people walked through the door, 115 of them were pregnant women or new moms within the past six months. And, and just let it be known for the fire marshal mostly that um, that was <laughs> during the course of the day, not all at once, so. <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's a few moments of concern, but we, we made it through. Um, there were lots of uh, RSVPs, but a lot of people that just got the word out through KSFM and Channel 10 and Channel 13 and showed up that day that maybe didn't know about it earlier, registered on site and came in just because of all the media that we had. Um, we had lots of games going on the, where they could earn raffle tickets and the games were um, like creating your own baby bib and just different things because it's a shower so you had to have games and you had to have cupcakes and food. Um, and then the ra they got raffle tickets to win really cool um, essential baby items. And so uh, with that, we have uh, we actually had four different video clips from the different news segments, and we just put them all together into one ongoing stream. So could we please cue the video? <coughs> Strangers are throwing you a baby shower. Now, whether you are pregnant or you've just had your baby, this is one of the things that you can come down to the Oak Park Community Center. If you have your stroller, you can actually drive through and they will tell you if your stroller is connected into your car, the right, excuse me, your stroller, your car seat, if it's connected right into your car, because obviously that's a big concern and you want to make sure that baby is safe. And what about diapers. They have gifts for you. These people who have never met you have gifts for your baby if you come on down here to the Oak Park Community Center. Now this happens at 11 o'clock this morning and Sharon why is this so important for First Five to have this baby shower? We are so excited to be here today First Five Sacramento and Sac Healthy Baby. We want to bring families together, connect them to important resources, have a great time getting ready for a baby and most importantly we're here because we want to promote healthy pregnancies, healthy babies. So what are some of the things that people should know? Obviously we got to talk about prenatal care, but then after the baby's born, there are some things that can be really damaging to the baby. What are some of those things? People will learn great things here today around safe sleep, around how to um, handle stress, nutrition, breastfeeding, all these really important things are gonna be here today. Okay, and now we, we, we're showing you some of these gifts because there's gonna be prizes, there's gonna be raffle prizes, but not only that, there's some baby shower games as well because you know, of course, if you go to a baby shower, they have those games. So what's in the bag? They have this game, guess the number they have where you can decorate your own little bib and of course, they have cupcakes because no baby shower is complete without something good to eat. Now, Sharon, people can come down here 11 to 2. Some people have already pre-registered, yes. but even if they didn't, they can still come down and find out info. What are some of the freebies that they get besides the cupcakes, diapers? What else? There are um, books here. There's baby food. There's um, more and more diapers and wipes. Um, and really just, again, getting connected to these different resources. They're going to have all kinds of freebies and giveaways. Okay, and I love it. Let me introduce you to Janine over here with her son Landon, only three and a half weeks old. Now, she, he was in the car or in the uh, stroller. I said, do you want to wake him up? Just leave him in the stroller. She said, well, he kept me up all night. So because <laughs> now when baby sleeps, you're supposed to sleep, right? How's that going? Easier said than done. Okay, that's what I figured. <laughs> I said, now how did you have time to get ready this morning and what'd you do? Uh, I gave my gave the baby to my husband and said, you watch him for a little bit, I need to get dressed. How important <laughs> is it for um, not only pregnant women, but women with little babies like Landon here to come out to something like this? Oh, it's so important. You know, with the new baby, there's so much information. Even if you're not a first time mom, there's so many things to think about and get ready for, things change. So to be able to come and not just get free prizes, but get great information from all of the different organizations in Sacramento is so important. Okay, perfect. I feel like Landon was trying to give me a little pound it there. Aww. All right, guys. <laughs> oh, cute. All right. Thanks, Camby. A Sacramento-based organization is helping equip expecting parents with the right knowledge and tools before their child is born. New at 5, Cammie Brown went to a special baby shower today and shows us why this information they're providing is so important. So I kind of want to learn everything like before it ha like before she comes. E Kim is due in less than two weeks with her first baby. She's at the first five baby shower to have some fun and get vital information. I really expect you know learn about safe sleep and 
uh, what to feed my baby and pretty much all the things that I kind of already know, but it's good to keep learning more and new things. Learning about safe sleep is so important because sometimes your elders advice like your parents or grandparents may not always be best. Things do change over time. For example, years ago, babies would sleep on their tummies, and we thought that was a safe thing to do, and now we know it is not. Linda helped plan this baby shower, and in its second year, is especially needed because of harrowing statistics. African-American children die at twice the rate of children of, of other races here in our community, and it's time that we do something about it. The Oak Park Community Center is filled with new and expecting moms, winning raffle prizes, playing baby shower games, and most importantly, getting connected to resources and important Important information. They we're making it a fun day, but it's all about healthy moms, healthy babies, healthy pregnancies. I love it. Free diapers and wipes were given to all the moms who attended. You just got to stand there and, and do you. This is an Oak Park. Parents like Jamila Ali got tips today on how to be better at the toughest job in the world, being a mom or dad. The sad reality is that African-American children in Sacramento County die at twice the rate of other children. And the hope is that raising awareness about the issue will help change that. So Force 5 Sacramento puts on this event to teach new or future parents about things like car seat safety, swaddling, and the proper way babies should sleep. Every baby is born with unending potential and it all depends on what we do as adults. Obviously what parents do, but what the community does as well to help them. This is the second year they've hosted this event and looks like it was a success. Clearly got the mayor's support. Way to go, first five. Reason for this, and there's a reason for why it's free. I want to give you an alarming statistic here. Recent data reveals that African American children in Sacramento County die at twice the rate of other children. So now there is this event that expecting parents can go to to get some help to make sure that they, their families, and their babies are healthy. Joining us this morning with the free community baby shower, helping new moms, is Phil Cerna, Sacramento County Board of Supervisors, and also Janine Gaines, a new mom. Congratulations. Thank you. Landon? Yes. It's just precious, uh, adorable. You. you were part in putting together the first one, which was last year, and you felt a need to get involved and do this. Please tell us why. Um, you know, here in Sacramento County, we are very fortunate that we're really resource rich. There are a lot of organizations and a lot of people really dedicated to helping reduce um, the infant death rate here in Sacramento County. So by bringing all of those groups together and having it kind of be a one-stop shop for parents was really important. Uh Phil, let's talk about why it's so important for Sacramento to get on board with this and help out new parents in our community. Sure, May, and uh, thanks for having us this morning. Uh, you mentioned the data uh, that African American uh, children, unfortunately, in this county uh, have been dying at twice the rate uh, compared to other uh, ethnic groups. And so there's been a very concerted effort over the last uh, five years uh, to make sure that we uh, we challenge uh, that that data and make sure that we uh, understand it, but more importantly, that we uh, reduce those those death rates. And so you're bringing together a lot of people from the community. What can people expect, and who can they expect to talk to when they come out? Well, when they come to the baby shower, they're going to, um, as was mentioned earlier, they're going to uh, encounter a, a number of community resources, a number of our our uh, um, various nonprofits that are dedicated to child welfare in the community will have uh, various resources, information, uh, everything from uh, health to uh, managing uh, your pregnancy. Um, and I do want to stress that this is not just for expecting moms. I want to make sure that dads too, that dads too actually yeah. have an opportunity to come out and uh, be, get educated on, on the facts and uh, how best to be very prepared for uh, parenthood. Jenny, being a part of it and putting it together, and also receiving some of the benefits from it. How has it helped you and your family? Um, well, you know, there's so much to think about and get ready yeah. for when you're having a new baby. Even if it's not your first, it might be your fourth. Things change so quickly. Um, so being able to talk to people, talk to experts, you know, there's so Absolutely. much different information um, going around. So to talk to the people who are really in the field and study it every day has been so important. Because it certainly takes a village. And a village like Sacramento, we, Sacramento just comes together and helps out communities. We've seen it so many different times and at different groups, especially how, how much more important of a group can we get than expecting parents, new parents? That's that's exactly right. And I, I, would, I would also go a little further in terms sure. of being a, a local policymaker that I would challenge anyone to 
to tell me that this isn't uh, the most important uh, effort that we have underway right now to make sure that uh, kids, regardless of their zip code, sure. regardless of their ethnicity, have the same opportunities uh, at life and, and living a healthy, uh, long, prosperous life here in Sacramento County. <laughs> they are our future. Yeah. Very well said. Thank you to both of you. So, new parents, moms and dads, here's the info that you need to take part in this free event, the Pride and Joy Community Baby Shower. Again, it's free. It is taking place Saturday, February 25th. It's going on from 11 until 2 o'clock. You can head out to the Oak Park Community Center. That's on Martin Luther King Jr. Your boulevard again to take part in this event which is free for expecting parents thank you so much to both of you for being with us this morning great community event going on here guys back to you oh, how cool is that yeah. anything to take a little bit of pressure off new parents yeah pretty exciting huh got a lot of good coverage out of it i sent the observer ad to our um, article to you this morning so just wonderful um, Before we leave uh, yes. the, the event, uh, Jill, I just want to extend my thanks again to, to everyone. And there was a small army of folks uh, responsible for putting on such a successful event. And I was, I was blown away when I got to the, the actual um, baby shower, uh, having, uh, I think we had over 100 people actually lined up at the door before they were oh. open. Yes. So to see the parking lot overflow uh, almost well onto uh, MLK Boulevard there, uh, uh, just driving in the parking lot, I knew it was going to be successful just uh, by way of the attendance. But, uh, you know, having a chance to um, spend some quality time, I spent probably an hour and a half there um, talking to the various uh, nonprofit representatives and, and others that uh, were so um, eager to share uh, what they had to share with uh, new parents that it, was, uh, it wasn't just a feel good event, it was actually very substantive in terms of. Yep. Uh, people taking advantage of it for all the reasons that were cited in the in the news clip. <coughs> so, yes. uh, special thanks to to Aaron and uh, to Running Salzman and um, to uh, Linda, um, or is it Sharon? Is it might be Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Linda put a, a great deal of time and effort in, uh, into this, so I want to make sure that she is uh, thanked um, wholeheartedly. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, something else that happened last week that didn't make the ED report is that um, First Five California launched its new media campaign uh, on February 27th. It builds upon read, talk, and talk, read, and sing campaign. Um, and you'll hear that new, the new campaign is called it's the Smarter Birds, and it focuses on three birds. It's very uh, interactive. It will be all around Sacramento and TV, radio, digital, and social media. And um, their First Five California is also working with our own partner, Crossings TV, to have it translated into a variety of languages. And so well, this is just a 30-second clip. Uh, so when you see it, you'll know, uh, you'll know what it is. So if you could please roll the clip. From the moment they're born, give them the love that helps them on their way. Talk, read, sing. Watch their little brains grow. It changes everything. Talk with your baby from your heart. Read them a book. It's very smart. Sing them a song. It's a wonderful start. Do it every day. Help them on their way. Talk, read, sing. Go to First Five California Talk. <laughs> Pretty cute. <laughs> uh, and finally, last week, uh, First Five Sacramento took a historic first step for us to be able to support legislation and policy change. And using the commission's approved policy protocol, uh, Commissioner Chair Serna and our Sustainability Committee Chair Sneeringer um, made it possible for First Five Sacramento to sign on to letters of support for AB 60 and uh, for the Every Child Succeeds Act to incorporate early learning um, into the act. So two things we, we got to do for the first time and we're really happy about that. That concludes my executive director's report. Very good, thank you. Commissioner Wirtz? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, three questions, uh, going back to the, f the dental transformation one for the first question. Uh, how many years is that grant for? 
Four years. Four years. So 11.5 over the four years? Over four years, yes. Um, and then the, the second question around the continuing steps, putting kids uh, first and the work with uh, trying to get local control accountability plans to incorporate better focus on early learning. I'm wondering, is there any effort to try to incorporate into that um, the concepts of, of sort of trauma and the uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences, sciences around trauma-informed approaches and, and, and resiliency building? Is there any language around that and is there any thought about incorporating um, that kind of um, both the framing and the science of that? Good question. Uh, as you may have saw, seen in the um, strategic plan, we actually did add some language to our strategic plan around trauma-informed uh -huh. care. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure is mm -hmm. the truthful answer mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't quite know yet. I know that Children Now is developing a toolkit to help county uh, commissions and others work with school districts and to, to be a support for them um, to, um, to make that happen. And I don't know if they're including it, but I'll, I'll certainly add it as a question when we get together. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, the next question, I also attended the Senator Pan town hall, oh. sort of expecting a totally different um, <laughs> phenomena. Uh, you know, I was coming out to support um, um, putting children first and having Bill of Rights for children, uh, which seemed, um, and I think there's a, the reason I'm speaking on it, I think there's a lesson to be learned there that um, I was shocked to see that there was opposition. <laughs> um, and it wasn't about putting children first. It was about the fears of what um, the framing of that was about. So I just, it's a good example of the difficulty it is to, first of all, it's a good example of why we need to step back and think that um, people might not perceive things the same way we do. Yes. <laughs> That's the f first lesson for me. Uh, and I think I was signed up as, you know, probably speaker number 240 or something, um, so I didn't get to speak. Um, but it was very informative. And, you know, of course, Senator Pan has taken leadership on other health issues, and he's taken, um, he's, you know, there's been opposition to his position on vaccination, and he's taken, um, he's the target of, of opposition around that. And so, unfortunately, this Bill of Rights is being uh, painted in part as the same, uh, with the same brush that this is somehow trying to take away parents' um, uh, authority and control in their families. And, and I think everyone tried to do a good job, and I thought several of the, ad of the advocates of the bill were making it very clear that this was about putting a children's bill of rights together is fundamentally about strengthening families and helping families address um, how best to serve their, their children. And I think we have a long ways to go about getting the framing right on that so that people um, aren't easily swayed that there's somehow an opposition there. So I, th I, I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from that session. Certainly it was eye-opening to me to, um, to, to see that. Uh, and then, um, uh, Finally, I just wanted to say that I, I just thought uh, Linda did a super job of framing on, I, I had seen that earlier, and I'm sure Aaron and team helped prepare you for that, but you did uh, what I can never do, which is stay on message and, and make a clear message. You know? So uh, kudos for you being the voice that, that we had and uh, Phil as well, you know, I, I, but it's hard to do that in front of a camera, so I just wanted to say that. And, uh, and then I'm also pleased around the policy work that uh, I'm seeing happening here, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions for our executive director? All right, thank you. Before we go on to the next item, I have um, a late uh, speaker uh, slip here for um, off agenda. So uh, is it Jeanette Newman Velez? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Jeanette Newman Velez, and I'm with a CRP WIC program, which is one of the um, uh, funded uh, projects through First Five for the Community Lactation Assistance Program. I wanted to bring awareness to the commissioners about a community event that's taking place this Saturday on um, March 11th at the Sojourner Truth Museum in South Sacramento um, through the F uh, First Mother's Breastfeeding Project. It's a something that was born in the community that they're trying to address 
African-American infant death by addressing the disparity in breastfeeding. So just as we want to make sure babies are on their backs asleep and that you know we're making sure that they are safe in, in many ways, we all also want to make sure that what's going in them is taken into account. And there's a great disparity, unfortunately, in how many babies are breastfed in the African-American community. And so this group is trying to uh, bring awareness to that. So they're going to be having a discussion panel that's going to be facilitated by, um, sorry, I forgot her name. It's Heather Clark. She's uh, a certified midwife and has done a lot of work in actually the South area trying to not only address breastfeeding, but just birthing issues. So we're excited to be ha able to have here. And I just would like to invite any of the commissioners that could come. And I appreciate also our first five staff, um, Aaron Maury was able to put it on the website. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak about it and consider attending this weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Next item, please. Item four, public hearing, review, and comment on the 2018 strategic plan. I'm going to stand for this one. I never do this. <laughs> um, OK, let me make sure. Can we get the uh, PowerPoint up, please? Fantastic. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you today our strategic plan for fiscal years 2018 through 2021. And on behalf of the work group and the staff, we thank the many community partners who contributed toward its development. This plan is the roadmap to ensure that First Five Sacramento funds uh, funds a range, a, a comprehensive range of prevention and early intervention services for children and their parents. Additionally, First Five Sacramento will invest in systemic improvements made through policy change, parent engagement, and expanding new revenue sources for kids. Last summer, the commission appointed a strategic plan work group whose charge was to participate in the process of developing the plan. The work group met six times over the course of nine months and approved the draft plan that is before you today for review and comment. As you can see from this graph, First Five Sacramento has fewer dollars to invest in this strategic plan. This is, am I still on? This is primarily due. Sorry, that one doesn't work. This is primarily due to our declining revenue stream. All right, someone's fighting me on the mic here. Don't touch anything. Oh, Mic's on. My bad, Mr. Chair. Okay. <laughs> We're good? Okay. Uh, it's due to our declining revenue stream and the commission um, strategic decision to, uh, to help shore up the safety net uh, during the recent recession. Beginning in 2009, as you can see, the commission stepped in to assist the county by picking up all or partial funding of several critical safety net services that otherwise would have been lost. Those include medical clearance exams for children removed from their homes, oral health screenings, and the Birth and Beyond program. The 2018 strategic plan includes a 21% reduction in overall budget as compared to our current strategic plan. And this step down is the first of two that will occur. Another step down is anticipated in 2021. At the end of our 2018 strategic plan period, the commission will essentially be a money in and money out operation. Um, we will have depleted the majority of our reserves will hold approximately $3,000, 3000 sorry, $3 million in reserve um, to be kept on hand for cash flow and to make sure that we can pay our contractors. Our strategic plan symbolizes First Five Sacramento's commitment to children and families. As stewards of public funds, the goal of our investment is to ensure that children receive uh, the best start in life, that parents have the tools to help their children succeed, and that, par and that um, providers uh, are prepared to best serve children, and that the systems serving children are streamlined and efficient. The Commission developed these six strategic funding principles, uh, which you see here, and these principles guided the work of the work group through the creation of the new plan. <laughs> Furthermore, these principles will be used when crafting our two complementary pieces to the strategic plan, and that's the implementation plan and the system sustainability plan. So these are these six were critical to um, driving our our planning process. 
Okay, I'm just gonna throw them all up there because that's how I work. Okay, um, so this slide represents our roadmap for the strategic planning process. In July, we approved the vision, mission, and principles, and in August, we collected data to create a trend report, and that trend report is included in your uh, strategic plan packet. We also conducted two community needs assessment surveys, one with parents and one with providers. Um, and then in September, we used a set of agreed upon criteria to prioritize the 15 result areas in our current strategic plan. We knew that we had to narrow down the number of result areas to stay in line with our strategic planning principles, specifically to make narrow and deep investments. In order to make the difficult budget reductions in a meaningful and data-informed and transparent manner, the work group created a set of prioritization criteria as a lens through which to look at each of those result areas. And we reviewed, evaluated, and scored the 15 result areas. After scoring each result area, we updated the hierarchy to reflect the priorities, and then we gathered community input. Um, I wanted to briefly just tell you what the criteria were. They're, they're in there, but I think they're important to mention. We looked at the severity of need um, in the community, including uh, disparities. Um, we looked at the magnitude of the, meet, of the need, so how many people in our community, children or parents, were affected. We looked at whether or not the result was identified as a high priority from the parents and the providers. And we looked at whether there were gaps and resources that could be filled by other funding outside of First Five Dollars. We also looked at First Five's capacity to make an impact and our ability to address disparities and to make systemic change. Those were a lot of criteria that this work group worked through on all 15 result areas to um, provide you with this new hierarchy. So the 2018 strategic planning process was intended to identify the results which, um, which had the greatest needs and therefore required sustained first five um, investment. And conversely, other result areas were found to have resor other resources that could potentially offset first five investments. Or they had areas that could be impacted through policy change or systems work. Therefore, First Five Sacramento is going to use a two-pronged approach, which you'll uh, be able to see in a strategic hierarchy, to promote our desired results. Um, we will focus on direct service efforts. Those are the ones in yellow. Those direct services are made possible through our partnerships, our contracts with community-based organizations and, publicly f and public programs. And then we will also fund systems sustainability efforts. Those are the green boxes. Um, and our systems efforts will include policy change at the local or state level that improves the way systems serve children and families. We'll focus on ensuring that the public is informed and willing to act to improve outcomes for children and parents. And we will attempt to maximize financial resources, specifically working to ensure that systems are sustained and expanded through new funding, through leveraged funding, and through better use of existing funding. We also have some hybrids in there that you'll see, uh, the green to yellow, yellow to green. Those are uh, result areas for which we're going to be uh, doing both of the strategies. So, uh, beginning on page 16 of the strategic plan, you'll see that each of the 10 desired results has a page dedicated to covering the need, the supporting data, the indicators to watch, the potential program strategies, and the potential system sustainability strategies. Rather than covering all 10 of these with you, I'm just gonna walk you through one example of how the data is laid out. And so we'll look at result area two, which, was, which is increased uh, prevalence and duration of breastfeeding. As you can see, we looked at breastfeeding rates among the total population and its specific race and ethnicities to help us determine what the need was. Three indicators will be tracked in the new strategic planning process for this result area, as you can see, and we have identified 
two potential programmatic or direct service strategies and five potential systems sustainability strategies, which I won't read through, but this is uh, sort of the layout for each of the 10 result areas that we're looking at. Some may have only um, uh, potential programmatic strategies and some may have only systems change strategies and some may have both depending on the color. Julie, if I can interrupt real quick. Sure. Is this kind of a common um, dashboard uh, view that we would see for um, each of these? Yes, so th exactly. Yeah. So you will have 10 of these throughout because we have 10 result areas, so one for each. And so, we have learned, we learned quite a bit <laughs> through this process. Um, it was an enlightening process. Uh, we learned several things of importance along the way. And the trend report showed us that needs and disparities still persist, and that our children and families are not doing well in some of our key areas, including health and dental utilization, as well as access to prenatal care. Um, our birth outcomes, especially for certain races and ethnicities, are still not what we would like to see. Preschool access has declined, and there are still a group of children who are not ready for kindergarten. And our child maltreatment rates still are of concern. When we held community forums, we were again reminded that many residents still do not know about the services that are available to them. First Five and our contractors have an opportunity and a responsibility to promote our programs and our services better. We can't meet the community needs alone, and um, this plan helped us identify areas where we think there's potential to tap new partners um, or new resources, and that additional work will sort of be laid out in our system sustainability plan. And finally, we can and have to, do, have to be more strategic with our financial resources. We found several results for which other funding streams could be tapped, thereby reducing First Five's investment. Those include MA, um, MA, bill, MA claiming, Medi-Cal billing, and potentially um, accessing the Affordable Care Act to um, get the services that are supposed to be covered there. Because of our funding reductions, it's imperative we draw upon these whenever possible in the future. This slide lays out our three-year spending plan with a little over $60 million invested, or about $20 million per year for three years. As I mentioned, we have a 21% reduction for the new plan period over the final year of our current strategic plan. 90.5% of first five investments are directed toward programs and services, 6.8% toward administration, and 2.7% toward evaluation of our investments. What's the asterisk? Uh, that was my uh, something I left on there from before. It was to remind me to tell you how much <laughs> of a percentage they are, but you don't really need and that to asterisk. Re to remind the chair to ask you the question? OK, got it. Exactly. OK. Our uh, final big slide here. As mentioned earlier, the strategic plan sets the frame for what we want to achieve. Within that, we need to further break down our priorities into actionable pieces. And after this plan is created, is uh, approved, we're going to create um, an implementation plan that will spell out our uh, strategies for each result. And the strategic plan you are seeing today does not have those specific strategies. It has potential strategies for both um, program and systems change, but we, we don't have them um, fully identified right now. That will happen in the implementation plan. And um, we'll also create a system sustainability plan, and that will identify the systems level approaches that we'll take um, for those uh, green and green and yellow uh, boxes. Once those two plans are complete, we can then um, finalize our evaluation plan, which describes the measurements uh, for direct service and systems change, green box, and then once all of that is done, uh, hopefully by about August of this year, um, we, uh, we will embark on our contract extensions or our competitive bid processes as uh, applicable to ensure that contracts are in place and services continue without interruption from the current plan into the next plan. I appreciate the uh, graphic. Yes. <laughs> 
Any questions for me? Questions for Executive Director. Thank you for uh, outlining this. This is important You're work. Welcome. Um, few of us have been through the exercise before. I think you, you've you uh, refined it, um, taken us in a slightly different direction, but I think it's uh, actually, looks, to me, the architecture of it looks like it's very thoughtful and um, I think going to be very well received by uh, those that are going to be doing uh, most of the, the legwork on this. So I appreciate it, Julie. Thank you. It was really, the work group um, was amazing. So thank you to our commissioners from the work group. and. Um, I, I, I think it's going to be a good plan to go forward. Devil's in the details, of course, so coming at you, the implementation plan and the system sustainability plan, but this is that sort of 10,000 foot level that we needed to get down first. And I, I, I wasn't uh, just um, trying to get a laugh there with my comment about the graphic during our briefing. I did, I kept on hearing a plan. There's this plan and that plan, so I just wanted to make sure that there was something that gave uh, both this commission and the public the idea of how they're all connected to get us to the point where we're actually um, issuing contracts. So, appreciate that. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's an info item, and no one has signed up to speak, so we'll go on to our next item, please. Item five, present first five Sacramento annual evaluation report. Okay, so two big things at today's meeting. Our second is um, uh, accumulation of all of the work that was done in fiscal year 15-16 by our contractors. Um, and we have Mikhail Newport Vera from uh, ASR here to give us an update on our findings. Oh, uh, Commissioner Serna, uh, because it was a public hearing, did you have to do anything formal to open and close anything, or? Not according to my okay. script, and I'm looking at our counsel, and he's saying no. Thank you. Just wanted yep. to check. <coughs> All right. Uh, as Julie said, my name is Mikhail newport Bear. I'm from Applied Survey Research, and I'm very happy uh, today to present the results of the evaluation for fiscal year 2015-2016. All right, so just a quick overview of the purpose and methods of our evaluation. Uh, so our focus when we were developing the evaluation plan was really to be able to say something about uh, progress towards items outlined in the strategic hierarchy. So Julie showed you the new and improved strategic hierarchy. Um, just to remind you, we're working off um, the version for this uh, this cycle right now. Um, so we have the same three priority areas and then the goals under that and then the results under that. So we specifically identified indicators to address those results. Um, as far as data sources, uh, we the service data we use came primarily from Persimony. So many programs do provide individual level service data that we were able to access. Um, some programs only provide aggregate level data, um, usually in the form of quarterly reports. We also uh, drew data from the family information form. So this was a new form we had developed um, for this fiscal year, um, and we're continuing to use um, in the current fiscal year. Uh, but so it, it looks at demographics as well as questions related to specific indicators. It includes a side for parent information as well as a side for child information. Um, most programs um, are participating, the ones that have individual level uh, data. And so clients complete it at intake and many clients also complete it at follow up three to six months later. Um, other data we had was program specific outcome data. So this included things like surveys or follow-up calls to determine you know where their changes in knowledge or attitudes or behavior specific to a particular program um, as well as health measures and then finally, um, you'll see some highlights from in-depth evaluations that are conducted. So there are three areas um, that conduct in-depth evaluations. Those are school readiness, um, effective parenting, and then reducing African-American infant deaths. Um, so you'll see that while each of those uh, has their own full report, we will show you some of the highlights as they relate to the strategic hierarchy. All right, so um, a quick overview of the profile of first five clients for FY15-16. Uh, so you'll see um, a little over 60,000 duplicated clients, and that included nearly 23,000 unduplicated clients. Uh, 80, about 8,500 were children, and nearly 15, or sorry, 80, 
yeah, 8,500 and then 15,000 um, were adults. In terms of the demographics, you'll see the pie chart um, below uh, showing race ethnicity. About a third were Sp Hispanic Latino, another 19% African American. In general, these two groups are overrepresented um, in the first five clientele compared to the county as a whole, uh, whereas whites and Asians tend to be underrepresented to com compared to the county as a whole. If I can interrupt, um, a couple questions. Uh, where do we draw the line? Uh, how do we determine whether the client served as an adult versus a child? And that makes sound like a silly question, but if you have a child being served, obviously there, it's a family being served. So how do we how do we make that distinction? So yeah, so first just to clarify, the, the demographics here are for families, um, but it, as in terms of parent and children, I mean a lot of that comes from, and Carmen, I don't know if you want to speak to this at all, but some of it is, you know, in proximity, you know, how children are reported. I will say that for the family information form, we do collect, um, there are certain programs where the parent is a primary participant, but we do collect the child's data with the assumption that, you know, if a parent participates in a program, we're going to see benefits for the child that we may be able to see on that form. And then um, in terms of the the unduplicated client distribution between uh, child and adult, do we know how, is this pretty t typical in terms of the percentages to other first fives across the state? I'm not sure I can speak to that. We don't have comparison data. Um, we can get that information though, um, however, and you'll see more of this, um, you will see next month actually we will come to you with the First Five California report which will have this information and, and I can make a comparison at that time for you. I'd be curious to know what that looks like in other counties. Sure. Thanks. And then as far as primary language, most reported their primary language is English. Um, nearly a quarter did report that Spanish is their primary language. So now I'm going to go over uh, the services and outcomes that we found according to uh, the goals in the strategic hierarchy. So in the report, you'll see it's laid out by result area, but for the purposes of the presentation, we're doing it kind of at the goal level. Um, so there are, I will warn you, a lot of numbers in this presentation. So um, I may not say all the numbers that are on our slides, but I think it's important for you to get a sense of kind of how many people are being served in each of these programs. Um, as we go through. So um, to address this goal of access to health and dental care, Hearts for Kids provided medical clearance exam and dental screening to nearly 500 children in protective custody. Um, so that we saw that about two thirds were referred for dental care. And of those who got a developmental screening, about half were referred to a service. And of uh, the 485 that were screened, six children were found to be physically or sexually abused. Sacramento Covered provided healthcare navigation services to about 1,700 uh, children, families, and pregnant women. They also provided one-on-one -on -one education to most of those people. Um, they helped to schedule 340 appointments and make sure that 226 appointments were actually attended. In regards to the dental part of this goal, the Smile Keepers Mobile Dental Program provided dental screenings to about 8,000 kids. Most of those kids also received uh, one or mostly two uh, fluoride varnishes. Um, they also provided oral health education to about 500 parents at WIC sites. So as far as children are born healthy, as you know, what the primary component of, for this goal is reducing African-American infant deaths. So the Cultural Broker Program is a big contributor towards this goal. And they served 440 women, African-American women, during the fiscal year. Uh, we saw some really positive trends in terms of outcomes. So comparing uh, the rates of low birth weight and premature births for uh, babies born to Cultural Broker participants compared to African-Americans um, in the county as a whole, we saw much lower rates, especially for premature births. So the next goal is children are healthy. So WIC's Community Lactation Assistance Program contributes to this. They served about 5,000 mothers, um, providing support to help them breastfeed. And again, we saw positive outcomes with uh, the six-month exclusively breastfed rate uh, being 22% among WIC participants compared to a national rate of about 16%.
And then another program was Safe Sleep Baby. So they provided workshops to providers as well as parents to promote safe sleep practices. And then home visitors also provided information um, to parents about safe sleep and um, cribs were also distributed. So looking at parents who participated in a workshop, received a crib and filled out that follow-up survey, over 90% said that they were performing all five safe sleep practices. And again, regarding the dental component, so Smile Keepers um, does provide the results of the screenings that they conduct. Um, we see among those approximately 8,000 kids, about 29% needed non-urgent dental care and 6% needed urgent care. Yeah, yeah. May I comment on that? Or yes. Want to wait till the end? Either way. Go ahead. Um, I noticed, uh, and I guess uh, I'm just looking carefully at this, uh, wonder why, dental, but um, one of the things was um, uh, Smile Keepers provides oral health education. And I think that's oral health education, I believe, just wanted a kind of confirmation of that, is embedded in all our providers, um, uh, part of their planning and programming. And it seems like uh, in some one of the evaluations in your uh, strategic plan, you mentioned that um, perhaps um, dental health was ranked a little lower, and I'm thinking given that this commission uh, funded a study by Barbara Avid that talked about the education being not quite up to par and that she recommended that we have a robust education program that tracked kind of before and after measures, making sure that they understood that the first tooth, first birthday mm -hmm. is a key point of, you know, having a well baby check is not just a physical exam by a medical doctor, but also by a dental. Anyway, some of the educational components and having it tracked in a data uh, rich way, I think, would be helpful in seeing how effective of um, that education has improved with our context. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that comment. And one thing that was not included in the presentation because we couldn't include everything is that there, of the 600 people or 500 people that received that education, there was a very small group, I think about 50 people, who they actually did get some follow up data on showing that the education was um, effective in at least increasing knowledge about those concepts. So that could be used as a model, perhaps, in how we talk about these things with other parents. Commissioner Wirtz. Uh, just because we stopped, I'll go back and just highlight one thing about the infant um, programs. So you showed a very powerful findings that the uh, African American uh, uh, sample that received services had both lower birth weights and prematurity. Uh, you didn't report, because it's long report, that there were also no deaths mm -hmm. uh, among correct. this group. And I did a, you know, just a general estimate, um, and at least two deaths would be expected. Um, so I just want to highlight that, that these do translate into um, lives saved as well. And, and it's a long, hard struggle, but I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. All right, so moving into the next goal, and this is actually also the next priority area in terms of early care and development. Uh, so this is children are an environment conducive to their development. So one of the programs that helps to achieve this, this is really high quality uh, early education settings, is Preschool Bridging Model Plus, or PBM Plus. So they provided on-site instructional support and TA to 118 providers. And their way of looking at improvement for these providers is a, a tool called CLASS, which really looks at the environment that children are in when they're in these settings. So as you can see from the figure, they saw uh, improvements from pre to post in all domains for both the preschool classrooms and the toddler classrooms. And those are all statistically significant. Another program that helped to achieve this goal is the child, Quality Child Care Collaborative, which is administered by Child Action. Um, they also provide uh, a variety of supportive services to both center and family child care programs. So these 167 centers that they supported have a capacity to serve over 5,000 children. So just kind of keeping in mind that by helping supporting these providers, that then leads to better care for, for many children. Um, so the, their efforts are part of a two-year program. So we have pre-class data for them for this fiscal year. And then during the current fiscal year, they are collecting the, the posts. So next year, we'll be able to report um, changes for these providers. 
So looking at the next. Excuse me, Commissioner Hertz. Um, sorry, just um, to follow up on that piece right there. Um, one of the things I've, I'm wanting the evaluation committee to to work on is that the, these interventions also occurred in prior years, mm -hmm. um, and um, and some of them got assessments then. And I'm just want us to um, make sure that we have continuity of the measurement there, where if if we got a pretest uh, in the previous previous year, then maybe we didn't get the post-test until this year, but we should still be able to have more continuity, and it's not just for this item, but more continuity of, of the measurement across time. And I know we've talked about this, sometimes if the measurement changes, mm -hmm. then it doesn't make sense. But for some of these, um, these are standard psychometric yep. tools, uh, and we should be able to see over time uh, that we take advantage of the data that we have at, at every point over time, and not always start with this year is baseline. <laughs> uh, so just a, a point for the evaluation committee to figure out how to help programs and, and you do that work. Great. Thank you. Um, so then moving on to the next goal in this priority area, which is children enter kindergarten ready to learn. One of the programs that addresses this is Project SOARS, which served about 300 children, nearly 300 parents, through a variety of support resources and developmental screenings. Um, so this is actually one of the programs that follows up on the referrals to see if they actually translate into families accessing those services. And what they found is among the 58 children who received a developmental referral, by the end of the fiscal year, 53% had accessed that service and 24% were being assessed to make sure that they were um, they qualified for that service. And then among the 22 children referred for mental health needs, over 50% had accessed services by the end of the fiscal year. So this is something Steve has talked about a lot in terms of wanting to really see do these referrals translate to services. And it's, it's difficult for a lot of providers to get that data, but we do have a few that are able to follow up with families. On, on something like that, uh, especially the the mental health referrals, is is that something that we should appropriately be looking at again other county, uh, other first fives across the state to see how well we we compare and do we have apples to apples uh, data to do that? We can look into that. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I mean, it, it it's it's great information, but it's it's kind of it needs to me it needs some context. We certainly can look into it. It it is difficult because every commission works independently and they provide different services. So we have this particular service here in Sacramento. It doesn't mean that you know Contra Costa County may be. Um, doing the same program, or if they even do the same program, it may not be the same types of strategies. So, but we can certainly look into it and see what we can find. Yeah, and I think another challenging component is that the target population may vary from county to county. So Project SOARS has a very particular um, population that they focus on, and so that may vary um, by county as well. But we can definitely look into, are there kind of comparable programs? Okay, thank you. Commissioner Wurtz and then uh, Julie Galelo. Yeah, and just to clarify that uh, Sacramento County had not been doing, uh, Sac uh, First Five had not been funding these uh, developmental screenings before um, this effort here with Project SOAR. And it was, I think, a, a, a major gap in terms of uh, infants who, and, and very young children who experience any kind of um, developmental delay or issue if the data is amazingly clear if you intervene early you can make lifelong uh, trajectory changes in their outcomes and so uh, uh, this is really a, um, a great expansion of something and I'm not sure how many other uh, first fives are even doing this but it's it's um, something that I've really as a developmental psychologist I've really been pushing to make sure that we had and I think it's pretty unique and I'm and I'm really pleased to see uh, the follow-ups and this is a good example where I want to see if that 59 percent ups to 75 you know next year at some point for these kids because I know it takes time to do that but this is a pretty unique program and uh, it would be interesting to just see how many other programs actually do early infant uh, and child uh, screenings thank you um, yeah that's that's great comments and this project soars is definitely a homegrown uh, screening and referral 
program, but there is a statewide effort that currently has 18 counties and one that I'm uh, working with SCOE right now, which is called Help Me Grow. And I would really love to morph our project source into Help Me Grow, where there is a standardized data system that tracks follow-up, it tracks referrals, follow-up, and all of that, and reports back uh, in a statewide effort, but you could see what's happening locally in each county. Um, we are just filling out the paperwork right now to become a national affiliate, and uh, over the next 18 months or so, I really hope that we're able to, to sort of morph our uh, project source into Help Me Grow, and it will really help with data collection and telling a bigger story. Great. Thank you. Julie. All right, so the next uh, program that addresses this goal is Sacramento Public Library. So they focus on low-income housing complexes, and they issued library cards to 341 families. They also have bookmobiles that go around um, to increase access to books, and they um, provided early learners early literacy workshops to 66 families. So these were multi-session um, workshops to teach um, literacy strategies and reading to children and that kind of thing. And then finally, the Crocker Art Museum provides a variety of um, resources to, for families to use art as an early learning uh, resource. And they also provided a museum tour and art workshop to 246 children who are attending school readiness programs. And then next, uh, the nine school districts are kind of the, the big um, program when it comes to school readiness. So they provided school readiness services to over 5,000 children and nearly 5,000 parents and giver caregivers across the 44 sites in the nine districts. Um, again, this is one of the in-depth evaluation areas, so we'll have a full comprehensive report for this later in the spring. Um, but I did want to highlight some of the findings, um, many of which are similar to what you've seen in the past. So looking at this first one, specifically uh, children who attended a first five supported preschool, a much higher percentage of those children were ready compared to those who had no preschool experience. Um, and then another outcome that we saw saw a lot of um, positive results from. And this was because we had family information form data this year. One of the questions is, how often do you read with your child? So we were able to look at reading frequency at intake, so when parents at the beginning of the school year and then um, at the end of the school year. And what we saw was 52% of parents at the beginning said they read at least five times a week. By the end of the school year, that was up to 68%. Um, so that was a great uh, improvement we saw there. And then finally, a, a finding that we've seen in the past, which is that children who participated in one of these school readiness services, or, or their parent did, um, engaged in at least four kindergarten transition activities, or were more, more likely to do that. Um, and then moving on to the final priority area, uh, which is empowered families. Um, so the first goal in this area is communities connect to families. 211 responded to over 12,000 calls from parents of children ages 0 to 5 and made 750 health referrals. One of the process goals for 211 is that they answer at least 80% of calls within 120 seconds. And this was met or exceeded in the third, of, third and fourth quarter of the fiscal year. Um, they also do follow-up calls with a very small percentage of their clients to see if the referrals translated to services. And of the 600 clients they contacted, um, about half had received the services and about 34% needed <coughs> further assistance. Another program, which is relatively new, that actually started in March of 2016 are the Community Building Grants. So these are grants of $5,000 that are made to a couple of community members um, to really have these community groups around certain topics. So there were six groups that engaged approximately 100 families across the groups. Um, we conducted in-depth interviews with the leaders as well as a focus group with some of the participants to really get their sense for what the benefits were. Uh, one of the big things that came out was the social support. So this was for parenting in general, and just being able to talk to other parents, but then also issue specific. So you know, there were groups for fathers, groups for English learners, groups for deaf parents, and to be able to talk to parents who are dealing with those specific issues was really powerful. Um, another thing that came out was opportunity for parents to learn new information skills and strategies to help them be better parents. And finally, just this opportunity for children and parents to learn and play together, both within their family and then as well as with other families, so the benefits of for the kids of having that kind of social interaction. 
Um, and then again, we have some information from our family information form that allows us to look at some findings across um, programs. So we had over 2,000 parents who had both intake and follow-up family information form data, and we had a we had several questions that address social support and resource knowledge. And we saw across all questions there was a significant increase um, in the percentage of parents who agreed or strongly agreed from pre to post. You'll see that in general they all start fairly high, um, but we still saw increases. And we also saw that the questions related to knowledge of community resources and where to go um, tended to be lower at intake compared to the social support questions. So finally, family support children's development and safety. So the main uh, provider for this area is Birth and Beyond. Again, um, they have uh, a big report that will be coming out. Um, I believe you'll hear about that at the next, um, or at the meeting in May. Um, but I do want to highlight, again, some of the findings we saw. Um, so they served about 1,600 children and uh, about twice that many caregivers through parenting, education, crisis intervention, and home visiting. Um, so th the figure shows changes in uh, risk scores from the adolescent and adult parenting inventory. So it's really set of attitudes um, about parenting that have been linked to child maltreatment. Um, so across all three groups, we saw um, improvements in risk um, from pre to post. And we've also seen just kind of preliminary um, glimpse into the report that's coming out that is isn't that in, as in past years, um, very low rates of CPS involvement after parents have participated in this home visiting program. So we're definitely seeing that these changes in attitudes are also translating into changes in behavior. And then second in this area is crisis nurseries. Um, so they served about 600 children, nearly 400 families. Um, parents report their stress, li li stress level at intake and exit. Uh, we had about 60% of parents who redu reduced their stress level during this time, and most parents agreed or strongly agreed that they were better able to solve uh, crisis situations after receiving the services. Uh, there's also a high level of parent satisfaction um, with the care that their child received. And finally, we looked into how many times parents um, use the services during the fiscal year just to kind of get a sense of, you know, is it they just come and they get that issue addressed and then they're good, or is it kind of an ongoing thing? And we did find that nearly half of families had more than two stays during the fiscal year. So it's possible that they could have, there could be even more if we include oops, uh, previous fiscal years that had more, more than one use. But I think that's definitely something to look into and kind of think about how we expect expect um, this service to operate. So finally, some next steps for evaluation. Um, as I mentioned, we get a lot of um, service data, pretty much all of our service data from Persimony. And I give Carmen a lot of credit for the work she's done um, this past year to really increase the quality of that data to ensure there's consistency in the way contractors are reporting the type, the duration, and uh, the frequency of those services. Um, so we're just continuing to, to have even more consistency there. Um, we're also, you know, to the extent we can, trying to get even more individual level data. So this year, Smile Keepers is piloting um, a form that will actually be able to get individual level data for children and be able to look at you know, that first and second screening um, for individual children and look at their characteristics um, so that hopefully we can kind of say more about the impact of those services. Um, and PBM Plus has also been providing us more individual level data as well. Um, we're also in the process of trying to get more precise numbers for first five clients. So this applies specifically to the WIC uh, breastfeeding program. So in the past, they've been able to give us numbers for all WIC clients, many of which include first five clients. Um, but they, they've really been trying to figure out how to flag those first five clients in their system so we can look at their outcomes specifically. Um, and then finally, increasing the number of clients who complete the follow-up family information form. So we saw a lot of positive trends with this data, um, but it, it's still a fairly small percentage of all the parents who are served. So the more parents we can get data from, the more robust conclusions we can make about the impact of our programs. So that is my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions? Commissioner Wirtz. Uh, both of these reports, the, the strategic plan and the annual evaluation report were um, done through the uh, applied survey research group and I think you know some real credit goes to your work on, on both of these efforts. Um, I think it, you've made it 
easy for us to work with, and um, I, I think the results are, um, um, I think you've been able to show us what results we have, what limitations we have, and, and so on. So I, uh, kudos to, I think, our, our contractees who are doing this work. But of course, the, the staff at First Five and Carmen in particular, you know, in terms of uh, proximity, um, have really indicated um, a, a commitment to uh, using data effectively. And, and I think even with our providers, we've had some evaluation committee meetings where um, the information is shared, and I think providers better understand and why and how the data can be used, and, and I think that all goes together to keep us working on, on providing, creating data that's useful for us to look at and see how do we improve programs on it. So <coughs> overall, I think this is really a good indication of our efforts to try to use data effectively. So thank you. And Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No, this is uh, terrific information. I uh, appreciate it very much. Carmen, you're being... Thank you gratuitously for a uh, job well done. Um, so uh, continue the, the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no one signed up to speak on that. Uh, and that is also an info only item. So we don't need to take a vote. Um, next on the agenda, please. Item six, advisory committee update and appoint Emily Bowen. Okay. Well, hello again. I want to give you our report on February 10th, 2017. For the record, can you let us know who you are? Oh, I thought you knew. Okay. <laughs> we, we do, but you maybe do. someone Robert watching Robert Silva, doesn't. Chair, First Five Advisory Committee of Sacramento County. So Great. now we all know, right? Thank okay. you. Uh, first, with our commission report with Julie, uh, we discussed the success of the first house hall uh, town hall convening on January 11th. Um, we also discussed a little bit about, it was a success, but what are the next steps? Where do we see this going and how are we going to build momentum off of this? Because it was obviously, and I'd like to personally state this, thank you to Julie and the, and the staff, I attended that event, it was a great event. But we also want to see that moving forward. We started something, let's keep building. We discussed av advocacy on January 31st um, at the Capitol. Um, what we did discuss are the, um, the four key topics. Of course, they talked about the legislatures that were discussed and so forth, but we discussed the first five key investments in the area. What, what were those key investments? What did we see were the, the best investments? The state of the first five Sacramento declining funding. Uh, we always want updates on that. Feedback on the governor's budget and follow-up on First Five convening putting kids first. We wanted to know what is the follow-up from this. So again, we just want to see this momentum be, keep building. Um, also, we discussed, and we were very excited about Emily Bowen, which will be discussed in a moment, uh, to fill the lactation consultant category. We've been trying to fill that for a period of time, and we're very excited that we had someone with that vast experience to sit in that seat. So overwhelmingly, we approved that, of course. Uh, we did have a presentation on adverse childhood experience and resiliency from Wendy Scala, Scala? Scala? from Kaiser Permanente. Um, through this presentation, and if you ever get a chance to see it, it's a very powerful presentation on the effects of adverse childhood experiences, which we realize that a lot of people, a lot of children actually experience. And I think this was very, um, it really gave us an idea of really how these are going to affect children, not only now, but probably 20 years from now, too. Through this, it was recommended by the committee that I myself, the chair, Robert Silva, <laughs> should know that in, his, in my update to, to the commission that we recommend trauma-related language be included in the strategic plan and implementation plan, which has been done. But we also thought organizations working with First Five should receive training to become trauma-informed, screen families serve with the ACEs questionnaire and intake, and offer trauma intervention to families if needed and have those resources available. Um, again, Adverse Childhood Experiences and the ACEs program works hand in hand with what First Five is trying to implement, so we thought it was very important to bring that up to you. 
Um, we talked a little bit and received an update on the strategic plan update, which was, of course, was presented today. Uh, and um, we were very anxious because we know that a draft which was brought today, which we'll bring to our advisory board, I believe, down the road, uh, we were very anxious to see that. We're very excited about it. Um, just seeing these statistics today, it's obviously that First Five has a major impact in this community. Um, under announcements, Dave Baker, which is from the Sacramento Children's Home, and I believe is a new member, correct, um, had concerns regarding the proposed, not only the proposed cuts, but he requested that First Five staff ensure the application RFP process is not cumbersome for potential partners. He didn't want anybody to be discouraged away from this. Um, one of his experiences in the past was that it was a long process and that Although maybe his agency had vast experiences with grant processes, smaller agencies do not. And we didn't want those agencies to be excluded from that process and receiving those grants. So that was just sort of a concern. We discussed it for a few minutes and we're, you know, and hopefully we can assure that it is maybe not going to be an easy process because they are asking for grant money, but it's a process that everybody can follow and everybody can implement and actually um, complete to have the fair chance. So other than that, any questions? Any questions for no? Mr. Silva? No? Commissioner Wirtz. Okay, Mr. Thank you. Uh, I apologize uh, but for talking so much, but these are uh, very important <laughs> issues from, uh -huh. from my perspective. And one, I, I want to thank the advisory committee for both getting the, that, that exposure to, to the ACEs and, and trauma mm -hmm. um, and uh, making the recommendations you are. I think it's similar to what I was saying earlier that I think there is some work we can do to look at uh, what's happening around the country and, and California has some very good trauma-informed approach approaches uh, uh, to, to look at. Uh, one of the things I just want to sort of report related to that is that uh, the Department of uh, California Department of Public Health is having um, a speakers bureau on the afternoon of April 13th with uh, Dr. Ken Epstein uh, from San Francisco Department of Public Health where they are implementing uh, trauma-informed uh, practices uh, and starting with training of the 9,000 employees there. So there are models of how this is being implemented into um, into the institutions, and one of the things that we are stressing um, in our Essentials for Childhood approach is that it's not just about training workforce and treating pay clients respectfully and and asking not why are you doing not what are you doing but why are you doing it what's happened to you um, is that that has to happen at the institutional level and that's not only first five as an institution but the county uh, county departments and our providers have to first look at do they make their um, and it gets back to referrals for example mm -hmm. it can be re-traumatizing if you're told your problem your child has a problem go see X and X is not available um, so there is a lot of work there we're stressing the the community the system the organizational level of ad addressing trauma-informed approaches not simply the workforce and and the client interactions so. and I, I think too since we have Carolyn Curtis on, on our committee that is at the forefront of this work, it gives us somewhat of an advantage. And of course, commissioners that feel this work is important too, so thank you. Okay, we do need to take action uh, though to appoint. That's correct. Okay, uh, the action would be to appoint uh, Emily Bowen to the advisory committee. So moved. Okay, it's been moved by uh, Commissioner Wirtz. Is there a second? Chair will second. Uh, let's do a roll call vote, please. Dave Gordon? Aye. Steve Wirtz? Aye. Terrence Jones? Aye. Olivia Kassiri? Aye. Paul Lake? Aye. Scott Moe? Aye. Phil Cerna? Aye. Motion passed. Great, thank you. Item seven, please. No, item seven, sustainability committee update. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, we had our sustainability committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, but I feel like we've been working in between, so it seems like it never really ended. Um, we, I, I am very excited to report that we actually are 
on record taking a position on a piece of legislation. It's something that many of us have talked about for quite a long time. And I, I think that this was our first chance to try out our new process that we approved in the fall. And um, I'm pleased to report to you that we are uh, supporting AB 60. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of why it falls into our protocol, um, we have a a systems result area related to af access to affordable child care. And this bill would increase the eligibility level for families accessing child care services. So currently, families are eligible up to 70% of the state median income, which is lovely, except we're using a chart from 2005. So this bill would bring it to the current chart. And it would also implement some policies to allow families to have more stability once they are enrolled into a child care program. So I think it does meet our criteria of working to expand access to affordable child care, and it actually has its first policy hearing tomorrow in the Assembly Human Services Committee. So we'll keep you up to date on that. Uh, we also signed off on a letter to include early childhood education in the ESSA um, plan that the state is developing. And we did that in partnership with Children Now, who we have worked with as part of their pro-kid group. I can't remember what they call it. Um, that's it. <laughs> okay, so uh, we also talked a great deal about other pieces of legislation, and we decided to start slowly and try out our process. Of course, then the next day we approved our first bill, so so much for that. But uh, we really felt that since we're kind of new at this, that we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew, and that there really is a staff time component to tracking and participating in the legislative process. So we have invited Margot Gould from the First Five Association to attend our next meeting to inform us of what bills the association is going to be taking positions on. And then based on that, we'll make some decisions about our priorities and what we'll recommend to the commission going forward. We did also brainstorm opportunities and approaches to follow up from our convening in January. And we specifically talked about how we could do more grassroots work through our contractors and reaching out to the clients that they're serving so that they understand some of the different uh, priorities. And we talked also about following up with district offices and continuing to build relationships with our local elected officials. Um, relationships are where it's at. So we are really uh, looking forward to continuing that discussion. Um, as far as the bulk of our meeting, we talked about our system sustainability plan and all of those boxes that have any amount of green on them um, are the boxes boxes that we had some discussion about. We looked at what would be policy and advocacy objectives to meet some of those goals. And we actually have deferred to staff to come back to us with some prioritization, because we really need to be cognizant of the amount of bandwidth that they have to tackle these larger systems issues and uh, think through if we have to prioritize what would come first. So we will continue to work on finalizing that, and it will come to you in tandem with the implementation plan. Very good. Thank you. OK. Uh, last item is um, the commissioner's opportunity to make statements or ask questions. Commissioner Wirtz. Uh, two things. I think it was nice that we didn't put the evaluation uh, item on the agenda because I think you've heard plenty about that evaluation uh, today. So that's good. But I so I have another um, item that I think is really important for the commission to consider and be aware of. And I think we all are in various ways. But I think I want to formally s sort of put it onto our agenda. And and it comes from the Sacramento Immigration Coalition has been reporting more and more um, concerns about the impact of the federal and ICE uh, deportation policies and practices and, and, and immigration restrictions and how they are impacting our Sacramento counties and families, especially those uh, families of, uh, and children of color um, and undocumented uh, immigrants. So they are seeing, and I think we may all, if we're looking in our communities, be seeing uh, substantial fear, substantial trauma, substantial stresses in families about being split from their kids and uh, the fears and concerns about that, whether or not they're legally here or not, if they look different than me, a white privileged male, um, then they're at a much higher risk than, than, than I for being uh, 
and they're therefore facing a much stronger um, uh, stress and concern. We know, as, as um, Robert was just saying and I've said before, we know from ACES sciences that uh, institutional and structural barriers, racism, uh, discrimination, uh, produce traumatic and often uh, toxic stress that have lifetime impacts that translate to, as Dr. Kosiri knows, that ultimately translate to early deaths from a variety of chronic diseases. So given that, um, I am asking that both our commission, the staff, and our sustainability committee look at what policies and practices in Sacramento County exist or could exist um, or be put in place that would minimize these negative impacts um, and potential toxic stress to our families and children. For example, uh, and I'll be explicit, um, that Sacramento County um, law enforcement currently um, uh, supports ICE in maintaining an ability to um, um, in holding uh, people in, in jail, um, they allow ICE to come in beyond the time of the apparent appropriate release of those people uh, to be subject to potential ICE um, restrictions. And unfortunately, we receive something like seven to eight million dollars um, to do that. And that means our money is being used in part to cause stress and disharm and harm to our to our families. So I'm looking for us to look at ways that we look at how our county resources are being used and or can be used to reduce rather than increase the stress on our families. Any person in a community that thinks that the police are going to be coming and using their police forces to threaten their uh, families being split up for for immigration reasons rather than to protect their communities is putting our communities at risk and putting our families at risk. So I'm hoping that we can look at both sustainability ways of looking at that and, and also potentially policy ways to look at that. So this is for me, uh, although I'm not directly um, experiencing this, I've been working with people that have and I know this is real and I know it's um, potentially long term damage. So I just want to put that on the record for us to consider. Thank you, Commissioner Wirtz. I, I couldn't have said it any better. And um, I'm, I'm going to look to our council. That's something that, uh, Rick, we, we could schedule as a informational item um, addressing some of the, um, the sub-issues or the questions that Commissioner Wirtz just mentioned at a later commission meeting, is it not? That's correct. Okay. So I'm through the chair's uh, office, I'll work with you, Julie. Perfect. So that we agendize that appropriately and um, maybe um, Commissioner Wirtz, if you want to join me in trying to um, uh, shape uh, the, maybe compartmentalize some of the information that might be shared, that would be helpful. Certainly, I would appreciate that and I appreciate your interest and willingness. Very good. Commissioner Sneeringer. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a, an email that Julie sent out to all of you about Speaker Rendon's Blue Ribbon Commission on Early Childhood Education. They held their first meeting this morning and it is being co-chaired by Assembly Member Christina Garcia and our own Assembly Member Kevin McCarty. And they had a two hour conversation this morning getting the lay of the land and I was quite honored to be one of the panelists that laid out the subsidized child care system which is not an easy task but um, it was a, a good discussion and I think that there's real energy in the state legislature to try to make some proactive steps on our system for birth through five and early learning and I just wanted to let you all know that that took place. Excellent. Great. Thank you Excellent. very much. Okay. If there's no further business before this commission, we are adjourned. <laughs>